connecting with family and friends at your new dining table, sinking into a deep luxury pillow top bed, or choosing from an endless selection of must-have accessories. Take a moment at Easy Living Interiors. Cork, Waterford, Navan, Nace, Sandyford, Drogheda and now open in Wexford. Summer sale ends soon. Right team, now that we are experts in bread baking and homeschooling, we have a number of business priorities. Update our workplace, floors and walls with safety signage, install sanitising stations and kickstart our marketing. So let's get started. Call Snap. Trust Snap to deliver on time and on budget across COVID-19 safety signage and display, information videos, web and graphic design and future marketing campaigns. You say health and safety across your business, we say talk to snap.ie. I wish I was 50 years younger and I'd kick your ass. My fans can be the harshest critics, you know. And they often are. A wife is often the harshest critic <laughs> of her husband. <laughs> I thought I was invincible. That's what you're, you're trained to believe as a sports person. There was four million people in Ireland who knew much more about managing <laughs> football teams than I did. When it comes to music, I can spoof with the best. Your sporting career is the best time you'll have and, you know, you have to hang on to it for as long as you like because everything else is pretty crappy. And this is not lies. Stephen Rochford has never spoken to Jim McGill in his life. And you're welcome back to Off the Ball Saturday on News Talk. John Duggan with you through to five o'clock. You can text us on 53106. We're also streaming live as well now. You can watch us on the Off the Ball social channels for Periscope on Twitter, uh, for YouTube and for Facebook. At Off the Ball is our Twitter handle. We're also streaming on the new OTB Sports app. You can download that now for iOS and Android. Search OTB Sports in the App Store. So last week we spoke to three inter-county managers in the GA about the return of Gaelic football. Today we're joined by three men involved in club rugby throughout Ireland about the return of the game, uh, how it's been in recent months during the pandemic, the amateur game, how these new provincial conferences can work, this new series we're having from September, and what the future of the amateur club game might look like in the future. So we're joined by Scott DC, an out-half who once played in the European Cup semi-final for Munster and then ended up guiding Lansdowne to AIL success. He's currently the backs coach with the Dublin club. Shane Layden, who uh, played at underage level for Ireland, then Connacht, and who is now the captain of Buccaneers and Athlone. And Matt Brown, the Wigan native, who's doing a very solid job coaching Old Crescent Rugby Club in Limerick and Ross Bryan there in Limerick City. Gents, how are we getting on? Good afternoon. Good hey, how are you doing? Good afternoon. Great to have Hi you guys. on the show, lads. Um, lo love to talk about club rugby over the next hour. Uh, so many people around the country, over 200 clubs are, you know, uh, volunteers, participants, uh, players, uh, administrative staff. I know myself. I'm in the car draw, Matt, at uh, Old Crescent, down at Ross Bryan. Um, my mother's in Limerick City. So actually, we'll start with you, Matt, uh, and we'll bring everybody else in then as well. What's it been like over the last few months? What's the break been like? How's it been during the pandemic for you as club people? And uh, I'm sure you've missed the crack of, of everybody being around, Matt. Uh, yeah, it's, it's been a strange one, all right. Um, obviously, with everything closing down so quickly, I think people are all, all at a loss thinking, ah, sure, we'll get back to pre-season, it'll all be normal. And and then that that kind of didn't happen. And um, yeah, we were all a bit of, at a loose end, really. So just from a Old Crescent point of view, we actually did... Um, we did our reviews over Zoom. Um, we did a lot of communication with the players because um, they were kind of disappointed how we finished up, although we hadn't had the worst season. And <laughs> what's happened is we've actually ended up going back on the pitch before we would normally because I think everyone had cabin fever, so they were just mad to go for a run. So we got our COVID uh, officer in place and he told us what we couldn't couldn't do. And, and so we had fellas running in straight lines for a few weeks on a Tuesday night, which... Any other time, they would have told you where to go, but I think they were that <laughs> mad to get out. They were up and down the pitch like nobody's business. So, yeah, we're tipping away now, and obviously the new structure's coming in, and it's, you know, I suppose we're in a, uni a strange position in, in Munster because just Old Crescent finished 8th out of 15, so we could have ended up in the first or the second conference, and we've ended up in the first. Um, pros and cons to each, I suppose, but, geez, we'd want to be trained a bit harder coming up against some of those fellas, so... Yeah, it's been strange, but we're tipping away, you know, and the lads are in good spirits, so it's all good. What's it been like for you, Scott, at Lansdowne? Similar similar to what Matt was saying there, and that we, it all came to a, an end very quickly. Um, so we had to kind of, you know, sh shut down the club, shut down the training programme, shut down the season effectively. Uh, and then we kind of gave everyone a break. We kind of just said, go off, you know, make sure your, your families are safe, make sure yourself, uh, you're all safe yourselves. And then we kind of touched base again, kind of, you know, six, eight weeks later and said, 
as it stands, we have no, we had no um, direction what what the season was going to look like. And then, you know, over the last kind of six or eight weeks again, then the the seasons begin to take shape. Um, so we started uh, back with the players about three weeks ago now. Um, and similar to what I said, you know, very, very basic stuff at the start in terms of straight line running, very restricted in terms of numbers, very restricted in terms of exposure to players and, and a lot of the protocols you had to follow. Um, and then from last week, I think on July 20th, you know, we entered the next phase. So we're slightly bigger groups now. We can get into more kind of position specific skills and stuff. So we're we're getting back into it. But we've, we've actually just given the lads another week off now because we've we've gotten some clarity on the shape of the season and when it kicks off. We said, you know, we're we're probably going too hard too early. So we've given some the lads some time off again. Shane, captaining Buccaneers, are you just chomping at the bit now, or have you been really suffering from the fact that you haven't been able to play? Yeah, it, it, like it, it's been strange, I suppose. Scott and Matt both touched on it. it the season ended so quick. Um, no one kind of really knew what was going on. We were all predicting, oh, we'll be back in the pitch in six weeks or, or seven weeks. And, you know, it didn't materialise. Um, you know, we were back in two small groups there a couple of weeks ago on a Saturday, just just to split it up, backs and forwards, get back in the field. Uh, we have a new coaching team in this year, so, so they have new ideas. We had a, a couple of Zoom calls and, and Skype calls just to, to get the point across what way we were looking at it and how we we're going to do things. Um, I suppose, yeah, just as, as a player, we're, we're all really excited to get back, I suppose. The, the dreaded preseason isn't isn't as dreaded as it usually is, and um, there's there's an excitement there, you know. As I said, guys are guys are doing straight line running and just so happy to be out in the open air. Um, it, it's different, like, and it will be different for the next couple of weeks. And, and I suppose it's something that we're we're going to get used to. Um, but I suppose the social aspect and the fun of rugby is back, and that's the main thing. Absolutely. Um, guidelines, guys, around COVID nineteen. Um, we know, say, the provinces there's testing there. Um, what's the focus been regarding like regulations about protecting the welfare of players, of staff, of everybody involved at the club at the moment? Start with you on this one, uh, Scott. So we've had uh, we've had you know similar to what the guys are saying. We, we've had a, a COVID officer appointed. So Kieran Walsh, uh, who's also our honorary secretary, has, has taken up to the position of COVID officer. So he kind of tells us what we can and what we can't do. And the club have also uh, leveraged a, a kind of an online form, I suppose, that you have, you have to fill out on the day of training uh, every week. So unless you fill out the form, you can't train. And then you have to you know, confirm that you haven't been in contact with someone. You have to confirm that you haven't been abroad or that you haven't been advised to, to isolate. Um, and obviously, given you know, we're, we're entering August now, which is kind of you know, traditionally holiday season for, for lots of families and people, you know, they're, they're very strict on anyone who who's coming back from a, a country that's not on the, the inverted commas green list, making sure that they stay away for two weeks. Um, and then obviously if you're exposed to anyone, you stay away as well. So the COVID officer is, is very up to date on, on what the government are, are advising and what NEFET are advising. And we're, we're following that very, very strictly just because it, there's too much at stake in terms of, you know, if it could spread like wildfire through a club if, if, if you get one positive case. So um, we're, we're probably being very conservative and, and, and taking the, the, the right course of action there. Is there a worry, guys, with the fact that you are still amateur? Um, I was speaking to Mike Ross on the panel a few months ago and he was telling me, like, in a kind of a jokey way that, you know, there'd be a scrum pox anyway. Um, like, it's a very physical game. You've got scrums, you've got malls, you've got rooks. Uh, is there an underlying concern among the people that you've spoken to the club, your, you know, your, your fellow players, that... Um, somebody might be asymptomatic and then uh, could test positive and then we have a stop-start situation or is there a confidence in the guidelines that you're following will uh, minimise the risk? Yes, I suppose from from Buccaneers' point of view, you know, the, the guidelines are there and they're, they're proven from a medical point of view and as a player, you know, there's always going to be that doubt but... You know, if the guidelines are there and if players take res self-responsibility, you know, if you bring your own water, if you make sure you're filling out your, your documentation before training, you know, if you're ticking your boxes. And, and I suppose one of the biggest things that we've outlined as a club is if you don't feel well for any reason, whatever it is, just sit out the training, you know, it, there'll be plenty more sessions. You know, we, we don't want one, one person to bring down the whole squad or a number of people to bring down the whole tournament. And it's, it's just being smart about it and just making sure that, you know, you're ready to play and that your body's healthy and that you're doing the right things off the field to make sure that when, when you come together as a group that the risk is minimised. And yeah, we, yeah, one we'd, we'd, we'd be much the same with that, lads, with um, the logistics that went into to, to trying to get people on the pitch were, were through the roof. Our, our director of rugby, he had staggered start times and, like, 
it's okay for us just turning up at the time slot. Mm-hmm. The amount of work he must have put in, you know, again with the COVID officer, and I suppose you have to put a lot of trust into these fellas, eh? And 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 like Shane was saying there, you just trust the medical professionals, and if you stick to the guidelines, you keep your fingers crossed that that that, that you stay free of it, eh? Yeah, that's incredible. Like the the planning behind the scenes that is on, uh, that's been going on between our direct rugby and chairman of rugby and then obviously the coaching staff and the COVID officer and the, the club executive committee to make sure that, you know, we're not exposing the club, whether it be medically or, or otherwise. Um, and then there's all of the, uh, I suppose, the, the learning and, and education you have to give the players. And then you just have to hand it over to them and say, look, you know, th- these are the guidelines, these are parameters, these are the rules, and you have to give them, I suppose, a little bit of responsibility to, to uphold those and if and as, as Shane said if, if they are feeling a bit under the weather that they just don't come and there's there's no stigma attached to that or there's no mm. there's no taboo at all it's it's you're doing the right thing you're putting the club first you're putting your family first you're putting you know I suppose public health first at that stage um the uh what they're going to do then with the club season is they're going to have this energy energy a men's community series and the women's game as well they're going to have local conferences effectively in connacht with yourself uh shane and with buccaneers you've got badana galway corinthians galwegians and sligo you've got a, a leinster conference got with clontarf dublin university nace old belvedere old wesley st mary's terrenure and ucd and then you've got munster conference then as well with you uh matt with uh, you've got Cashel, Cork, Con, Gary Owen, Highfield, Shannon, UCC, and Young Munster. Then you've got semi finals, you've got a final for the Bateman Cup. Then next year, you've got the leagues as they were, but no promotion or no relegation. Um, does this kind of sound good to you guys? Uh, Matt, for example, you were doing well in Division Two. There's a chance of promotion to be two years now without it. Um, does it sit well with you the way they've kind of structured this to get people back on kind of a safe level from a regional point of view and then get back into the way it was? Um, yeah, I, I suppose it, there's, there's, there's two sides to it, really. Firstly, you completely respect um, the way they've gone with it and why they've done it and keeping it provincial-wide. Um, you know, I, I, I believe that probably is the right thing. And, and, look, it will be nice then in the second half to play in your um, in your own division, you know. The, I suppose I, I, I read an article from, from one of the other coaches in Limerick and, you know, he, he, was, he was saying that that, that, that it's all great and they've done the right thing health-wise, but he was questioning whether did we really need to do away with promotion relegation. Now, I know it's half a season, and I'd say there's pros and cons, and, you know, look, they've gone with it. I suppose for the clubs in 1A, they still get a chance to, you know, they play their AIL, and there's, there's, there's a lot to go for, whereas when you're in any division lower than that, you're kind of you're fighting to try and get up there, so kind of that's been taken away. But I suppose that's kind of that's kind of the selfish look at it, you know. And, and there is a bigger picture, and um, we did have to sell it to the players to say, look, this we might not be able to go for promotion, but there's a lot to play for. And, and the, our club in particular is, is is really trying to take big steps forward, and we've got huge numbers, uh, and it, and it's kind of it's thriving in that respect. And so we have to, you know, check, put put the spin on it that, that that we're actually going to go up against fellas who ultimately we want to be there now. Look, us going up against Cork Con, I mean, you might roll out a cricket scoreboard for that one. But look, we'll, we'll have to take our medicine on, on the odd occasion. But still, I mean, to get that kind of a game in, in Ross Bryan or, and even the, the, the local derbies against Gary Owen, Munsters, like Limerick, such a, a small co- rugby community, as in everybody knows everybody else. So there'll be some, there'll be some great nights around the town, I'd say, as in nights out at the, at, at the, at the rugby grounds, just because... You know, everyone knows everybody else. And look, we, we, we'd be massive underdogs, so there's nothing to lose in that respect. I suppose, like I say, the only thing is taking away that chance for promotion um, in the second half of the season. It's a tough one, but look, the, the, there's, there's smarter people than me making those decisions. So, look, we, we, we go along with it and we, we, we do what we can to get forward, really. Are you sold on the chain? Yeah, I suppose, I suppose the best that the Irish do done it. They've made a decision early and they've stuck with it and they've put a plan in place, you know, and we can kind of we can all kind of see where it's going and, and what we're playing for and what and what and what's ahead. And um, I suppose one of the biggest things with with the the Connacht conference is, you know, obviously we, we do the, the Connacht League is a, a bit of a pre-season tournament prior to the AL normally. And it's usually played out like that, you know, it, it kind of starts slow and you build into it, building towards the AL. So I suppose there might be a bit more of a needle to the derby games and a bit more needle in them coming back. So that'll be exciting, you know, playing probably home and away for Connacht as well. It'll be exciting. So I suppose from, I, I agree with what Matt's saying from, from after Christmas, you know, 
without the promotion, you know, it, if you're not in the running for the top four for a semi final, it might be a bit difficult for lads to get up to the game. But I suppose it's an opportunity, and in particular for Buccaneers, it's an opportunity for us to develop again. You know, another year we're kind of in a bit of a transitional period where we've younger lads coming through and, and we're, we're trying to develop players and you know it'll get lots of lots of our squad players and, and extended squad opportunities to, to express themselves for the for the next season and uh, for us that, that'll be really important and Scott for you with Lansdowne a lot of local derbies I suppose the frustrating thing is you can't have thousands of people there back where the way it was 20 years ago you actually now have the chance for local games against uh, teams in Leinster but it's a little bit uh, limited with the fact that we got all these uh, restrictions it is, but I think I think you know if you go back two months ago, there was there was talks that there might be any league at all. So yeah. I think to to have a competitive series before Christmas, while not perfect, is is obviously better than nothing. So we have, you know, obviously we're very fortunate that the the nine teams that are in the the first conference in Leinster are all one A or one B teams. So it'll be very competitive, and it'll it'll set us up very well for the AIL series, and then that happens after Christmas. So. I think you know you can look at it both ways, but I think you know you've got to put your 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 positive hat on and say we're we're getting competitive rugby. Hopefully, we might be able to get you know some sort of exposure or, or release of the some of the professional players to bring the standard up again. And you know, think that the goalposts might have changed by the time we start on September twenty sixth. That, that more players or more people might be allowed to. Uh, attend. Yeah, and on the flip side, uh, Matt, like no relegation, it does give you a chance as a coach to reset. Uh, without any consequences to say, okay, we're going to look at the people who are involved here in the panel and and, and try and progress some of the younger players. Yeah, it, it does. Um, that, again, that that's double edged with us. It certainly does from the squad. I suppose what's happened in Old Crescent the last couple of years, we, we've kind of reinvigorated the the twenty side of things, and we've got some some talented kids coming through. So I suppose we just got to find the balance now. Like you don't want to be throwing throwing too many young fellas in against uh, Gary Owen and Cork Con, but by the same token. You know, geez, if they come through something like that, then 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 they're in a, a great place. Come the come the AL. So yeah, like I mean, it's 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 really exciting to be honest. And I think once we got over the initial shock, the the the, the players have, have bought into that now. So um, they're all relishing relishing a, a a crack off some of the bigger teams. And like you say, yeah, we we've nothing to lose in that in that regard. Like any result we get would be a massive positive. And you know, it's um, plus I suppose. I think there's a restriction they can't actually play contracted players against us. Um, you know, which, uh, look, that's, that's, I, I, they've probably done that for safety reasons, but, you know, um, it makes it a bit more of a level playing field and sure, who knows, I suppose, once you get, you, you get out on a Saturday evening and, and see how it goes. But no, it'll be good. It'll be good. And uh, yeah, like I say, we can get a few young lads playing uh, against some top level teams and that's going to stand to them in our, in our long term plan, I suppose. So. Yeah, we'll see how we go. Yeah, we're speaking to Matt Brown here of Old Crescent, uh, Scott Deasy from uh, Lansdowne and Shane Layden of Buccaneers about club rugby, the return of it, how it's going to look, and maybe the future of the game as well. We've got a chance here, as I said this last week to the inter-county lads, to reimagine how certain sports and certain structures look because we've got a bit of time, time to think about it and not just go through the cycle of playing matches and, and looking at divisions. Um, we're going to talk about this a bit after the break as well, but finance and how you've been able to sustain what you do um, because uh, Neil here, our producer Neil Tracy, who is from Raheen, like he's involved in this uh, Matt in this pig and porter tag rugby uh, extravaganza every year in Limerick with Old Crescent. Um, you know, in missing that, like uh, the the generation of the funds, um, you've uh, had to rely, I'd say, a lot on sponsors. Uh, how has it been financially for you guys to just keep the show on the road? Yeah, well, well, I certainly, you know. I'm not kind of party to all that kind of side of things in the club. However, I do know they've been struggling, and I think our president came up with it. And there was a few, there was a few raised eyebrows when he did. Obviously, we lose the pig and porter; it's massive. Um, but um, he came up with a GoFundMe page, and I think we got in there, we, we got in there early. Um, and look, we just we just went to the club's uh, supporters and and uh, and. Um, sponsors and just said look can you give us a dig can you give us a dig out to get through the year because we, we we you know like the the incomes the income's gone um like you you know about that we have we, we run a car draw okay that's still going and um, big and porter's massive uh all our fundraisers now thankfully i think in the next week or so our golf classic's going to go ahead but i think revenue obviously will be down and, and there's no take over the bar obviously because it's closed but you know, we were in division with with three northern teams, so 
you know, you're taking away three three kind of big trips there. Maybe we'll we'll catch one of them in the second half of the season, but there will be a reduction in that. And I think you know a few a few, um, uh, a few things have had to be put on hold around the club and, and renovations and stuff like that. So, look, I think everyone's got to cut the cloth accordingly. Um, I haven't heard anything that we're, we, we've gone in too much in the red yet, but sure, we'll, we'll see how we go over the next month or two. And, and but, but look, I think everyone's aware they're going to have to adjust their expectations. And um, I think if we can just weather the storm, then they can start putting a plan in place for next year. And, and, and I think there'll be a massive fundraising effort through the year as well, maybe around. Like, I think one thing was said by the IRFU was that they were talking about galvanising the club game. Now, if you if you're playing within the province and if you can kind of get matchups with your opposition clubs with your seconds and your twenties and make a full day of it, you know maybe there's opportunities there. You get people in the gate and I know there's restrictions, so you can only do so much. But you know that the, there is a certain um, way to really you know get get the atmosphere in the club back up and try and bring people back into the club game. So I think there is a positive from that point of view. Um, like I say, if you, if you have one like an old um, in the Southern Hemisphere, like what one club would take all its teams to another club and you play throughout the day and the, the whole thing's a big party. Now, obviously, we'll have some restrictions, but if you could get to a model like that, I'd say you're not doing too bad and, and you can start building from there, maybe. I, I think the problem for the clubs, at, uh, you know, across the country is, you know, every, every club has their own different ways of generating revenue, depending on whether they're a community club or whether they're, you know, very well located in a, in a certain city or, or whatever, but... The big problem for the clubs will be uh, tickets. So obviously, international tickets are a huge source of revenue for for nearly every club. Um, but with the restrictions in in terms of how many people can go to internationals or how many people can go into the Aviva, I think how the how the IRFU prioritise, you know, where those tickets go to. Do they go to tenure hold, tenure ticket holders? Do they go to corporate sponsors, or do they get distributed via the clubs? That will be a big. Um, revenue either loss or, or gain to the clubs and I think it'll be interesting to see how that how that pans out in the next few weeks yeah. I suppose from a player's point of view there's you know we're, we're aware that there will be cup bots you know whether it's gear whether it's it, stuff like that like our main sponsors you know you're not going to expect them to fork out as much money after probably taking a hit themselves or being closed you know the, 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 the clubhouse is closed but there's opportunities, I think Matt touched on, there's opportunities there for the players to give back, to get out into the community, to do a bit of sponsorship, to get out, raise money for the club, you know, and in the same time kind of getting out into the into the community and, and people seeing us doing it. And, you know, you might bring a few supporters into the gate in, in the following week or even maybe next year when things settle down. You know, one thing that we're doing in Buccaneers is we're doing a bit of a, a run walk cycle and we're doing it as it's it's the same distance that we we'd be traveling on a normal ALL year so it, it's just short of 3,000 kilometers but um half the proceeds go to the Westmead Hospice and then half the proceeds come come back to the club and um, which kind of it helps as well because you know people want to support the medical facilities as well given all that they've done for us and then it also brings a bit, bit of revenue back in for us for, for, for funding the season because you know running a rugby club in the AL is not cheap yeah. Um, and I suppose, you know, you're talking to three ALL teams here and, and you know, we're probably in better better stead than some of the, the junior clubs around the country, you know. And, 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 you know, I know my local club, my my hometown, Carrick and Shannon, you know, they'll have a lot of work to do. You know, you're competing against Gaelic clubs. You're competing, you're out. You know, you have to get into the public and you just have to work harder than it. But yeah. I suppose the good thing is, is that, you know, people my age and my generation are probably back working from home and they're back in the community and, it, it, it'll be great to see them out there, you yeah. know, bringing, bringing something back. Sorry, Shane, we just got to take a break there. So uh, Shane Layden, uh, Matt Brown and Scott Deasy on Club Rugby in Ireland. Get your comments into 53106. Back after the news with more debate. Thank you. The Saturday panel on Off the Ball. At Renault, we want to be the first to bring you Buy Now, Pay Later. Our new 321 offer gives you three unmissable reasons to buy a new car. Three, that's three months real deferred payments. Plus two, 2.02% APR. Huge savings with Renault Bank. Plus one, 1,000 euro cashback. Yes, you get all three. Buy now, pay later from Renault. Visit your local Renault dealer today. 
Offer is made under a higher purchase agreement subject to lending criteria. Terms and conditions apply. See reno.ie. Looking for a breath of post-lockdown fresh air? Breathe in lovely Leitrim, a place where social distancing means hill walking through amazing scenery, exploring stunning blue ways, cycling, kayaking, supping, river cruising, fishing. Go on, inhale. Enjoy the comfort of one of our many hotels, guest houses, castles, eat in one of our many restaurants. Immerse yourself in historical sites. Sample life at a different pace. Leitrim. Explore. Experience. Enjoy. For offers, visit enjoyleitrim.com. I'm 43. We have one dependent, a daughter. You'll never defeat me. Yes, I will. Sorry, where were we? Want to talk pensions while playing table tennis with your daughter? Now you can. Chat from home by video or phone with your financial broker or advisor about retirement planning with Irish Life. It's a smart way to get your pension sorted and really perfect that backhand. We know Irish Life. We are Irish Life. Irish Life Assurance PLC is regulated by the Central Bank of Ireland. You know that feeling you get when you sense a team's winning streak is about to end? Or when you know the pundits are getting it all wrong? That feeling? That's me. I'm your hunch. I was there back in Istanbul when you just knew the comeback was on. I'm the guy that tells you when the odds don't look so odd. I'm your hunch. It's time to start listening. Heed your hunch with Betway. Download the app to find out more about Betway's Bet Club. Full terms apply. 18 plus, dunlouis.net. Bet the responsible way. Here's to our local independent businesses. For the last few months, they have been adapting and surviving, finding new ways to serve our communities. At Bank of Ireland, we're doing our bit. And because your financial well-being is our priority, our dedicated business teams can help you take the next step. So we can all keep tapping, clicking and collecting. And one day, getting back to what we all do best. We can, we will, begin. Bank of Ireland is regulated by the Central Bank of Ireland. This summer at Centra, we have everything you need. Like inspired by Centra Angus Beef Burgers, 852 gram, only 5 euro. Nestle Yorkie three pack and Kit Kat Chunky four pack, 1 euro 50 each. And our mega deal until Sunday, Carlsberg 20 bottle box, only 16 euro. Centra, live every day. Enjoy call sensibly. This summer, visit the iconic building that witnessed the birth of a nation. Discover the memories and experiences that tell the story of Ireland, from revolution to modern times. We declare the right of the people of Ireland to the ownership of Ireland. Hear the sounds, feel the impact, remember the people. Experience the GPO Museum in the heart of Dublin City. History so close, it comes alive. For bookings and opening times, visit gpowitnesshistory.ie. Kids go free until August 31st. Black Tag Summer Sale now on at Curry's PC World. Get free delivery on washing machines and refrigeration over 399. We've got 32 inch TVs from just 179. And savings of up to 150 euro on our huge range of big brand laptops. Get in store or online at curries.ie. T's and C's apply. This is an important message for Leaving Certificate and Leaving Certificate Applied students. It is now time to opt in to receive calculated grades. You must opt in on the Calculated Grades student portal between 12 noon on Monday 20th of July and 4 p.m. on Monday 27th of July. To opt in for Calculated Grades, go to gov.ie forward slash leaving certificate. On 106 to 108 FM. On Newstalk.com. On Smart Speaker. And on the Newstalk app. This is News Talk. It's two o'clock. Good afternoon. I'm Stephen Murphy. Hundreds of extra teachers are expected to be hired as part of the government's plans to reopen schools next month. The Irish Examiner reports it's part of a €200 million Euro package being prepared. There'll be improved cleaning practices and stricter social distancing rules for older children. The Cabinet is due to consider the plan on Monday, with the government hoping for a full reopening. Kieran Christie, General Secretary of the Association of Secondary Teachers, says it has to be done right. Teachers want to go back to schools. Students want to go back to schools. And uh, the important thing is is that we get them reopened and functioning to the maximum possible extent when the time comes along. The number of people in hospital with COVID-19 is at its lowest level since the peak. CEO of the HSE, Paul Reid, says 10 patients with the virus are currently being treated with five in intensive care. That's compared to a high of 140 people who were in ICU in April after being diagnosed with coronavirus. 
The Irish scientist leading the race for a coronavirus vaccine says it's likely that a lot of people will be waiting some time for it. Professor Adrian Hill from the University of Oxford is currently working on a trial that's been described as highly promising. However, speaking to the Irish Independent, Mr Hill says it's difficult to predict when supply would catch up with worldwide demand. Dr Ray Wally from the GP Expert Advisory Group on COVID-19 says Ireland's membership of the EU will be a factor in purchasing doses. We're very lucky that we signed into what the EU Commission has organised, that we're going to be part of the European-wide access to vaccines. We're a small country, we need to recognise that, but we've now got access to a purchase capacity at the same level as the rest of Europe. And five streets around Grafton Street in Dublin have banned cars on a trial basis. For the next four weekends, motorists will be barred from 11am until 7pm. This man on St William Street thinks it's a good idea. I think it's beneficial, you know. I think the, the traffic was obviously bad on this street before. People should be able to walk freely around town, is my opinion. It probably takes a lot of traffic out of the city and more bikes, more people walking around. So for me, it's a good thing, you know. It's two minutes past two. News Talk Weather. Thanks to the AA. Download the new AA app to request a roadside rescue and track the patrol right to your car. Dry today with bright spells, but there will be some scattered showers. Some of them will turn heavy or thundery. Highest temperature is 16 to 19 degrees. And now you're up to date on News Talk. The Saturday panel on Off the Ball. And you're welcome back to Off the Ball Saturday here on News Talk. This is the panel, 53106 for your text messages. You can tweet us at Off the Ball. We're also streaming us live as well now. You can watch us on the Off the Ball social channels for Periscope and Twitter at Off the Ball on YouTube, on Facebook. You can also watch us on the new OTB Sports app. Download that now for iOS and Android. Search OTB Sports in the App Store. Club rugby is our focus of conversation this afternoon. Get your questions in for the lads on the panel. Lansdowne's Scott DC, Shane Layden of Buccaneers and Matt Brown of Old Crescent. Delighted to have you on the show today, guys. Uh, we were just speaking before the break there before too with you, uh, Shane, especially on um, how clubs like Buccaneers have been able to try and get uh, the, the show to remain on the road uh, with fundraisers, that kind of thing. And also... Um, helping out the community. Have you seen uh, more interest from people? Obviously, maybe people now are looking around themselves a bit more. I know I am myself and thinking, well, there's a local GA club, there's a local rugby club. I might get down to support that or a League of Ireland club um, in this changed time. Maybe there's an opportunity in this crisis for people to get a bit more connected with their community, connected, say, with Buccaneers, Old Crescent or Lansdowne. Uh, Shane, give, have you seen that with, with the fundraising yeah. initiatives you've been doing? Yeah, look, I suppose um, before, you know, the whole lockdown and, and the, the coronavirus, there was so much sport on the telly and there was so much professional sport everywhere that maybe the club game and, the, you know, the, the Gaelic game, the club, club Gaelic game, the club rugby game kind of got forgotten a bit. Um, and I suppose, you know, with, with no fans going to any games, that it's going to draw a bit more attention because, you know, people are more conscious of what's going on in their local community of, of how Buccaneers are getting on or, or how your, your football team, how Shanghai's are getting on. And it's, it's, it's massive. I think that, you know, that we do get out there because the more we get out there, there is an opportunity. There is a big opportunity to bring fans back into the, into the club game. You know, there's, you see videos of the past of, 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 10,000 people at a Buccaneers game, you know, that, that that's unheard of at the moment. And, you know, obviously we can't do that, but down the line, maybe we can create a model that will, will get that many people back in to, to watch games. And I think one of the one of the big things, you know, with a local kind of Western region is that it, it draws attention, you know, if Bucks are playing Galway Eagles on a Saturday night, that is a game that people want to see. You know, maybe maybe it loses a bit if, if, if we're playing a Northern team, you know, the people don't have the the rivalry there, but if we're playing a, a Weasians or a Corinthians or a Sligo ball now, all of a sudden everyone's drawn to it because they remember the times when they played against them, and they remember, you know, no one wants to, to, to lose to their to their cousin from Galway or, or or, you know, Ireland's such a small small country that the matches will have so much more meaning to them, and I think that's that's a model that maybe you know further down the line it, it could be reviewed. Um, I suppose we found you know people have been so good, you know. People are obviously money has been cut back for everyone, but they're still giving back to their community, and they still want Buccaneers as a club to be to be able to survive. Yeah, I think I think we're seeing that across across the country as well. Um, yeah, you know, f fellas are who are either who, who stepped away from the game for work reasons, or or now they're actually back. They were abroad and they're back now, 
working in Ireland because they're you know they're working from home rather than, rather than paying rent in London or whatever. For, for example, a friend of mine, Ronan Corkery, he, he's wondering how he can get back involved in the club game. He hasn't played in you know five, six, seven years. A very good player back in the day, but now he's looking to get get back involved in his local game, local club. How can he co- contribute that way? Because the, I suppose they see the the importance of the club, whether it be soccer, rugby, Gaelic football, hurling, uh, to the to the community spirit, and I suppose the social fabric of that community. So, if that's an opportunity, or is that something we can explore further because of this pandemic? Great. Um, I think I think everyone will benefit from that. And Matt, are you seeing that down in Old Crescent as well? Uh, yeah, we, we would be seeing very much very much of that. Uh, uh, same as that. Sorry. Um, I think I was hearing stories that when they put the goal fund me out, they were they were getting contacted by people who probably had maybe have been to one game last year or something just because of um, you know where they were. Like Scott says, they they, they could be anywhere, but people are, are reconnecting. Uh, and then touching on what Shane says, I have to I have to uh, mention our players because they've been very good even over the last year or two. They do a lot of fundraising themselves, uh, and we have a, a core group who really they really try and and kind of. If the club's running something, they'll really get behind it, you know, and, and, and not just going to an event, but even the pushing of it as well. They do a lot of volunteering around the pig and porter and stuff like that because, you know, and obviously they get they get the benefits then. And I think, you know, the more they can be seen to do that and, and the, you know, it, I suppose the club player, you know, it's not all it's not all about what can be done for the player. I think that people need to realise now that, that how important these clubs are and, uh, you know, and really, really kind of give something back and, you know, we'd be pushing our lads to come down and help out with the underage, and when when it finally goes back, and then you hope if that gets a bit of momentum, more and more people get involved. And I think if you can draw people back to it, you might start, you might not recreate the glory days, but you know, long term, if you can get a, a bigger member base, it's only going to benefit. And sure, the players as well. Once they start playing, and there's more people there, and you know, there's more atmosphere, it, it becomes more enjoyable, and, you, and you, your connection with the club club. Uh, only gets stronger from there. So I think that probably would, for me, would be the big one where I think if we're going to get something positive positive out of this whole mess, I'd say that would be the avenue we go down and just, just get the clubs booming again or as much as is possible. Yeah, yeah. why can't you have both a strong, healthy provincial structure and a, a good club scene as well? Uh, Text in here in 53106. However hard the senior rugby clubs are going to have it, it's with the small junior clubs who are really going to struggle, already short on finance and bodies. Scotty's fitter than ever. He beat one of the young lads in a Bronco the other day. Hashtag one more year. What is a Bronco? I've no, is it an American car? What the hell is it? <laughs> it's, uh, I think it's one of the fitness tests that the, the pro teams are using these days. It's a, a kind of a shuttle run, out 20, out 40 and out 60 and back. Um, so I said I'd give it a lash there on Tuesday when they were, when they were testing the players and I uh, I surprised myself, but I think it was a, a one-hit wonder. I don't think I'd be able to back it up. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, lads. It's, uh, it's four and a half minutes of hell. Is it? <laughs> okay. Four and a half. If, if you hit four and a half, Shane, you're doing well. I didn't get anywhere near that. <laughs> That's what I was going to say. Or, or seven or eight minutes for some of our forwards. <laughs> <laughs> lads, lads, if I'm doing that, you can tell me with a calendar if you want. <laughs> Uh, hi lads, just a quick one. Why didn't they just finish the leagues from last year in January? Promotion is what it's all about. Yeah, I, I think that, that's 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 a question that's been bandied about a lot, and there's pros and cons to it. But I think um, you know a, a lot of clubs that have had a very strong position to say, you know, we've we've played 14 games, we're top of the league by X amount of points. You know, we we should have been promoted. And I think if the RFU chose to go down that route, I don't think you would have, could have had much complaints. Um, they've obviously chosen not to do that. They've chosen to uh, scrap all promotion from last year and relegation, and for the for, se- for the season coming, which you know Matt has addressed already, saying it's 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 an interesting mindset you've got to get yourself into. Um, personally, I suppose I wouldn't have any had any obje- objection to uh, promotion and relegation based on the standings of last year because we had you know completed over seventy five percent of the season, but they, but they chose not to. The glory days you're talking about there, Matt, uh, 20 years ago, we, we all know the stories of, uh, say, if it's Gary Owen and Young Munster and Limerick or um, Corcon and Cork or, and all these uh, clubs, you know, you're drawing massive crowds. The provincial game in Ireland wasn't strong in the amateur era. You had your Interpro derbies and that, but obviously with Munster and Leinster, travelling, the fans travelling abroad to these games in France and England, uh, the professional game, these, these provinces becoming hugely successful. 
with all the European Cups that they've won. I think it's six between the Munster and Leinster and, and Ulster as well in 1999. Um, have the IRFU uh, left you to your own devices? Uh, I know they're giving half a million to clubs around the country uh, and um, for a few months during this during this crisis. Um, but do you feel like you've got enough support as clubs? Do you feel a bit detached? Uh, the academy players are coming in at times. Is there good uh, rapport and a good synergy between the governing body and the clubs? Um, I, th I think I think everybody's coming at it for, with a different agenda. I mean, if you're in a club. Your your priority is your club, so you have you, you kind of people looking. Oh, what's best for us? What can we do? The IRF, you obviously have to take the broader view. Um, I certainly think there's some initiatives where where I, I think you know they're do, they're doing the best they can, and, and their revenues are massively hit. Um, but I suppose you could go around different clubs and they're like, oh well, we don't get this and we don't get that. I think we kind of like we talked about the players. We need to change the mindset and how can, how can we work it together and probably. It probably needs people who are slightly removed to look at the big picture as opposed, you know, there's always going to there's always going to be a difference of opinion. So I suppose it's hard to say whether they've. I don't feel like they've. I personally don't feel like they've they've discarded everyone, but I also don't think they can please everyone, and that's that's never that's never going to happen. Like, you know, I mean, Scott said there about not having an objection of, of uh, teams getting promoted and stuff, but like, and it probably only affected a couple. But you look at Highfield. And geez, your heart has to go out to them. Like they were dominating the division, um, you know, and they probably were pretty nailed on and going, you know, and and that's that's a, a tough one to take for them and feel for it. But you know, I presume if you would, if you were to take a step back and say, well, they're not doing it to spite Highfield. It's literally, look, we have to make this blanket decision, and that's the way it goes. And I'm sure that's the case for a lot of decisions, both financial and rugby wise. So. I don't think it's too much to say that they've, they've discarded everyone, but I do think they could take this opportunity now. Like Dave said, the clubs can reconnect with the community. It's a great opportunity for the RFU to, to, to reconnect with the clubs. And, you know, geez, what's the harm in now a few academy lads being... I mean, this will probably affect you, Scott, more than, than it would us, but, you know, mm -hmm. there's rugby there to be had for the for the academy players. And, you know, imagine the quality of 1A if, if they're all playing week in, week out. That And that's got to draw people in, I would say. Yeah. When the you know yeah, the plane. I, I, I think the, the 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 actual product, the AAL product itself, has never been as strong because I suppose I've been fortunate to be to be involved in the game for the last kind of twelve or thirteen seasons, and you know even in the the, the days when you know Peter Omani and, and Zebo and and Andrew Conway and these guys were playing, the the actual quality of the games wasn't as high as it is now because the, the level of coaching, the level of facilities, the support we get. From the from the clubs has never been greater. So the product itself is brilliant, and if you can add in some of those kind of you know academy players or, or professionals who are on the the fringes more often, your own it's it's you know it, it, logically the crowds are going to follow, um, and the the engagement's going to follow, and the media companies will follow, and it's kind of a self fulfilling prophecy there where you just it just gets stronger and stronger and stronger. And and now that they're taking this opportunity to try and realign the global calendars. To try and realign all the fixtures, maybe there is a place for the club game. But I don't know. Maybe I'm being a little bit aspirational there. But you know, <laughs> hopefully they can find some, uh, some, some, some area where we can fit in and we can we can really start to contribute to to the overall rugby landscape. I suppose Scott, that's probably one of the biggest arguments. You know, if if a, a couple of lads were released from Leinster Academy development contracts and Munster Academy development contracts, you know, would a would a Lansdowne first Cork Con on a Saturday be be just as good as a and a Leinster A versus Munster A, you know, from yeah. from looking at it, it, it probably would be like, and you know, the players might get more from it because they'd have the opportunity to do it week in, week out, you know, and it would bring, it would also bring the province back into the community as well, back into the club scene more, and you know, it it, it would grow in doing that, it would grow the club with the province because, you know, you're going to be getting high quality rugby and the lads are going to be playing and. You know, instead of being back for one game and then you mightn't see them for five games, they're going to be there and they're going to care about promotion. They're going to care about winning the league and, and they're going to care about winning the Bateman Cup. You know, and, and I think that would massively in, in, increase the level of, of, of the AL and, and it, would, it would bring it to the next level that, that we're looking to do. Did you feel uh, like uh, Shane and, and Scott when you were with like uh, Connacht and Munster respectively, you were in a bit of a bubble? Yeah, I suppose it, it's difficult and I suppose... Like we we both had the opportunity. To, Scott obviously played a lot of higher level, but we've had an opportunity to to be in the provincial setup and then to be in a club setup, 
And I suppose when you're in the provincial setup, you know, I was in the academy in Connacht and I would have still played a lot for Buccaneers at the time. But your your main goal and your main focus is to get to the next level for Connacht. And I know that's a selfish way of looking at it, but any professional sports person is selfish. You know, the, their main aspirations is probably impressing the coach on a Monday to a Thursday rather than impressing the coach on a Saturday for Buccaneers. You know, and then you flip it and, and, and you, you go to the other side and, and you become the club player and you're, you're on the outside, you're looking at the guys coming back to you and you're wondering why they're not maybe not giving, not even not giving it all because they do give it all. It's just their, their, their head isn't fully there. And, and it, it's hard because, as you said, the, the, the Monday to Thursday is where they put the hand up most of the times. And I suppose one of the big things in the last couple of years that, that we've had is that we've had Andy Friend come to a Buccaneers game, you know, and that's massive. It's massive for the, the academy players, the development players and the club players because, you know, you, you want to impress you want to impress the kind of manager whether you have a chance of playing for them or not. <laughs> yeah. But if, if those fringe players are under the impression that the, that the province are interested in their performance of their clubs mm-hmm. or you know, they get consistent feedback based on their performance by the provincial coaches, whether it be the academy manager or whether it be the, the assistant coaches for, for the senior team. That would mean, you know, they'll have to buy into playing with their club then. Whereas, I'm not sure, I haven't been involved in a long time, but if, if they're not getting that feedback regularly on their performance in the club games by their provincial counterparts, you know, why would they invest emotionally or, or mentally in, in playing for that club unless it's their local club and their home club? You know, there's a lot of a lot of situations where you know I'm from Crosshaven, I'm not from Cork City, um, and I played for for Cork Con for four years. You know, it's not my home club; it wasn't my home club at the time. Um, so if I was trying to get onto Munster, did they really care how I played for Cork Con? I don't know if they did or not. Um, so you, you have to kind of make sure that the the club player is aware that their performances for their clubs are being monitored regularly, being being assessed, and and they're seeing the growth or they're seeing the uh, the progression into the, the provincial setup from there. Is, is there a conflict or is there a bit of an us and them because if people have different mindsets given where they are in the game that it could cause a friction or do you see that or just people when they, they go past the white line everybody's together? If there, there can be but it is coming around that it, there isn't and um, you know I suppose in the, in the nature we are with Buccaneers we, we are a feeder team for, for young players to go into Connacht um, and I suppose, you know, don't get me wrong, that's definitely what we want to do. We want to get more players into the provincial setup. Um, and, you know, it, it's just about picking and choosing the guys you go after to come and play f- for books. You know, you, you want to get a, a good standard of, of a fella, not just at rugby, but you want to know that he's going to buy into what the club is trying to do. And I suppose that's one of the biggest things that, that we've looked at in the last couple of years is, you know, A, you want to bring your local lad and keep him, but B, then if, if, if another guy comes down from, from Leinster or Munster to Connacht and, and he's looking for a club team to play with that, you know, you do a bit of research and you see what sort of a guy he is and if he's going to buy into the, to the Buccaneers ethos on a Saturday. You can text yeah, and I, th- I think I think the, the big thing will be, will be, not sorry, will be, is that the, the top teams, especially in 1A and obviously by virtue of, of their position in, the, in the, the lower league, is that they don't want that chopping and changing every week of, of, a, of a player becoming available for one game and every four. What they want is consistency of selection so that they can build those those combinations or that relationship between players. So you'll see the likes of Connor, even, even Lansdowne for the last few years. We Yes, we've had some some guys on the fringes of Leinster, but the vast majority of our team selections are the same week in, week out because we have that, that core nucleus of players or that core spine of players that are club players only. They, they've either come out of the, the professional system or they're trying to get into the professional system or else there's a couple of guys who... Who are just happy playing Division One A, you know, regularly, and and they're the guys that we base our team around. And if, if we get the odd pro player in, you know, we might be able to accommodate that. But the the better clubs or the more successful clubs recently have built their teams on players who'll be there regularly. And Matt, just on that, uh, what Scott is saying there, if you got promoted to One A, One B obviously first, but even up to One A, would you get professional players? Would it be a, a tipping point when you'd actually get them? Um, to be honest, it is, it's a fu- it's a funny one. It, it's it's strange that as in I suppose we would become a viable option. Um, right now, I think in two A, I don't I don't think there'd be any any an any issue with a maybe an academy player coming in. Now, it's just it's just not happened. Now I have spoke to um, to Peter Malone actually on the you know the academy players coming up to Limerick and he's been very open if if there's a hole let him know and and, it, and you know because obviously if they are going to go back to clubs he probably want he probably does want them playing 
but it's just the way it's fallen. They do seem to, and, and I understand it because it makes sense for them to be playing the highest rugby week in, week out. I suppose if we, it's up to us to try and get up the leagues and then and then that becomes an option. Now, having said that, I would, much long before I came, the club's success in recent times is built on a group of individuals who've come from the under sixes up to the up to the seniors, um, and that's the model we've gone with again over the last two years. Our uh, Eugene McGovern's our director of rugby, and he's he's put a lot of work into the twenties, and he actually coaches them himself. And he's we we had some success last year, and and we've got a much stronger group this year again. And it, I think we're looking to be self-sustaining so that. We don't have to. We don't want to be, ever be relying on pro players. Having said that, it would be great to have one or two, you know, into the club. Like Scott says, you don't want to be changing your team every week. And I think just even just having them. From I remember at, at um, when I was coaching up in Galway that, you know, to find out that you're going to get someone on a Thursday night who you want to play. I don't think that's the the answer either. I mean. They're either in or they're not, and I understand if there could be a good bit of planning. And from what I hear, I think the planning has improved from back when what I used to hear about in Galway. It, it was kind of, you know, get a phone call or what. And I've heard, I've heard sometimes maybe the the bigger clubs in Limerick would have said, you know, it, it's kind of it, it messes with things if it's left last minute. But I think if there's good planning goes into it and fellas realise um, that like, okay, so you, you're going to be available for these two weeks, so maybe you could actually train with the club these two weeks. Uh, and, and not necessarily the contact element, but just so that they, they, they have more of a connection. And I think that comes back to what Shane was saying. I know, I, I know personally, I've noticed that for me, coaching actually becomes less about coaching over the years and more about the environment for the for the players. Because when you get the environment right, the coaching bit's quite easy. And and that's what Shane says. You don't want some fella who's coming in just to tick a box for his province. Ah, oh, geez, I, I played a game. You want him to come in and actually care. Um, and and I, I wouldn't want anyone in all Crescent coming in if they didn't care or if they didn't put something back in. I mean, they're in a such a privileged position to be getting paid to play the game. So, you know, what can you give back? And you know what? I'm sure 90% of people are like that, but you'd you'd want to be sure about it before before you kind of go and disrupting what's been working for you um, to accommodate extras. So that that would be my take on it. I don't know what the lads feel about that, but I think if you can if you can get the right individual into the right environment, then you're laughing. But otherwise, th there is potential pitfalls. I think. Yeah, and as a coach, I think you, you might agree, Matt. That you you want to see um, if a professional player or academy player is coming back and they're and they're playing a game for you. You want to see them show the difference between mm -hmm. what a professional player is and an AL player to say to you know to show to show your other players that this is the level you you have to get to if you want to get to that professional level um this is the level you have to train at this level you have to prepare at this is the level you have to perform at over over an 80 minute period because i think in the AL you have a lot of really 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 good players but you know maybe not able to string it together for 80 minutes or you know don't have the 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 skill set or whatever so you want to see that golf in class to show the the other players, this is what you got to get to. Um, and if you if you can marry that with the with the emotional or mental buy-in, I think it can be very very beneficial. But if they're coming back taking a box, it's not going to help anyone. Yeah, you want them to raise the standards as well, Scott. And you know, yeah. and, and most of the time you do, you get guys, and that's the buy-in we're talking about. If they buy into training on a Thursday night as well, you know, you get the standards raised. You know, majority of the times when you when you're playing with, with better players, you know. The, everyone else raised their standards because they don't want to be left behind and I think that that's one of the biggest things and that's one of the, the best things that the province can give back to the club is that you know by sending some of the academy lads or the fringe players for the senior team back to, to Buccaneers or to, or to Crescent or Lansdowne it brings them up you know it develops them it raises their standards it improves their skills you know you might learn something off them and, and that's what you're looking for you know it's, it's giving back to it's like what we said about player giving back to community it's the, it's the professional player giving back to the club uh, we're kind of uh, on the final stretch here of our chat about club rugby with uh, Scott DC, uh, Shane Layden and uh, Matt Brown. Lads, uh, just to kind of, as we we come towards the end of our great chat, um, what's the most enjoyable part of this, part of being the club? Like, for example, Scott, you were at Munster, as I said, a semi-final of the European Cup. You're at Lansdowne, you're, you know, you, I saw the picture there with your family, you're, you're winning an AIL or you're playing well. And, and Shane as well with Buccaneers, you're talking about the local rivalries match, you're, you know, you're, you're from Wigan, you're down in Limerick and you're coaching. What is the most enjoyable part of what you do and what you love doing? Matt, you can start. <laughs> um, well, for me, guys, I, 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 I won't lie, I miss, 
I miss playing rugby every single day. I absolutely miss it. And for me, uh, I, I love the coaching and it's probably the closest I can get. And, and, and I, I, I think I've been lucky with the clubs I've coached at that have just been around some great people. And like, I, I suppose the whole match day for me, it's great putting a lot of work in and, and then the enjoyment comes on the match day when you see, if you see that, you know, fellas are, are literally putting it all out there. They, they, they're giving it everything. Um, and I suppose we're on the amateur side of the game so that they, they, they work the socks off through the week. They, you know, you go up north and, and um, you know, you, 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 might, you get you get a result or even if you don't get a result, it's like, you know, they're coming together after and, you know, on our bus, you have somebody like Alex Simpson singing songs all the way back and it's just great crack and it takes me back to when I was playing because obviously I'm a bit older than the lads and it, it, it's some crack on the way down and, you know, you, you, you kind of keep that balance between working hard and then you have a bit of a bloat at the end of it and sure, for me, Limerick is such an unbelievable rugby city. I... Um, it's like there's just there's just you walk down the street and everyone know everyone's got a bit of an allegiance and there's always a bit of crack and they'll always be you know slagging you off about one thing or another but I just think that when it comes to a match day and and the before during and after for me you, you can't beat it really that's just me though being an old man <laughs> and I, I I would echo that I think the the main thing for me would be just the the two things one one is the friendships you build out of it and you know I I've played rugby with guys you know, 10, 12 years ago who I haven't seen since, but I know that if I see them on the street tomorrow, you know, we, we can get straight back into, you know, either a serious conversation or, or a bit of a sagging match, which is which is always nice to have. And then secondly, I think the life is so serious these days between work and, you know, I, I'm fortunate to have a family. Um, so there's a lot of kind of serious things going on. And then you get to go and have a bit of release with the lads on, on Tuesday and Thursday night on a, on a game on a Saturday. And you, and you kind of get that instantaneous result. So you, you win or you lose. And you, you lose together, you win together, and you have a bit of crack together on the bus, or you have a few pints afterwards, or whatever. Um, and I think you know money can't buy that. That's just that's just really really good fun with with, with good people, isn't it? Is the main thing. Yeah, it, it's hard to explain, I suppose. Over the whole kind of lockdown, rugby became so at the start unimportant, and then it became so important again. You know, the social aspect of getting back out onto the pitch, having a bit of fun with the lads. You know back training, back running, you know, just that competitive nature. And then, uh, I think Scott touched on it, that the ability to be able to have a serious conversation with one of one of your rugby friends and then have a slagging match in the exact next conversation is, is probably the one thing that it has. You know, it's 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 so enjoyable, yet it can be so serious as well at the same time. And I think you put your body on the line to win with with your friends. And I think that's one of, one of the most important things, you know, and... I suppose Matt touched on about keep playing, you know, uh, I've had fair share of injuries and, and lads probably look at you and say, why do you keep coming back? And, you know, you can't explain it, but you just do because you love it, I suppose. Well, Shane Layden, Scott DC, and Matt Brown, you've been great sports to share your uh, stories and your views of club rugby at the moment in the AAL. And uh, we wish you all the best success for the rest of 2020. Thanks so much for joining us on Off The Ball Saturday here on News Talk this afternoon. Thank Cheers. you. Thanks. 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 Cheers, lads. Mind yourself. 53106, your text messages back after this. Off the ball on News Talk. Splunk, our News Talk. Erin Splunk is staying in the Tuiraman Dochtur Machuo Tuhiler Hachtrocht and Realtas are Covid 19. Play him in the Deshness and the Duchloin and Royal and Snamian. Agus Ronan Mishdale, the Lairvassar Lauer John Bolton. The room where it happened. Blank. Le Cuon O'Flaherta, Air News Talk. Each dog subscribe and both trial and ish new air app news talk. It's fair to say that Sally always pictured her big day to be a bit, well, bigger. I did. And Neil really wanted to have all of their friends at the ceremony. I did. But thankfully, all those friends sent them cards and letters, best wishes and love. And as Sal and Neil read through them all, they both quickly realised it still was a really big day. It was just the wedding that was small. I do. I do. Send cheers. Send congratulations. Send love. At your local post office or online at onpost.com. Onpost. For your world. For the last few months, Suzuki dealers have been stuck at home like a lot of us. In Cork, Jane has broken her personal best for the 10k. <sighs> And in Dublin, John has started yoga. But now they're back and ready to help you to get going again 
with unmissable offers across the Suzuki range, including the new hybrid Vitara. For more details, contact your local dealer. Suzuki, helping you get back on the road. Stay connected with totally unlimited broadband from air for just $29.99 a month for six months. Sign up today and keep the whole family entertained with amazing content from Amazon Prime Video on us for a whole year. Plus, you'll get the Air Sport Pack free. For more on this amazing offer, why not drop into one of our stores or visit air.ie. Air, let's make possible. New customers only, $29.99 a month for six months, $49.99 a month thereafter, 12-month contract, subject to availability, bundle activation fee may apply. Full details and terms, the air.ie.